Daniela Mandolese from Materially. I want to share some information about uh, Materially to introduce uh, this talk. Uh, Materially is a consulting center of emerging uh, and sustainable innovative uh, materials and uh, process, uh, such as uh, bio-based materials, uh, but also growing materials and nanomaterials. Uh, today, we are going to uh, talk about uh, bio-based materials. Thanks, uh, Vivarium. Vivarium project uh, um, is uh, a project in form of exhibition, uh, talk, uh, workshop, uh, and um, that uh, go on uh, behind the days of Design Week, promoted by Materials, uh, Materially, sorry, and uh, Design and Total Tool Studio and uh, Giulia Ceppi. Uh, Vivario uh, wants to share uh, some information about the topic of bio-based uh, uh, materials um, and, um, and through uh, exhibition that you can visit here uh, and, and uh, also during the, this uh, talk. Uh, today, the talk called uh, The Metamorphosis of Matters and the New Lens of Design and uh, I, I would like to introduce uh, our guest, uh, Serena Camere, Head of Design and Sales uh, from Mogu. The, um, our guests uh, come from different backgrounds, and so also they have different uh, point of view. Um, and the second guest is uh, Veronica Sarbak from uh, Grete Project. Uh, Grete is a research project uh, um, founded by European Commission. And, uh, Kaori Akiyama from uh, uh, Studio Bicolor and the uh, Heart and Design uh, Studio. So, first of all, I ask you to share some information about your research uh, uh, company and uh, focus on um, materials. And uh, uh, we can start uh, with the, uh, to show a short video. After that, uh, I um, leave the floor to Serena Camere. Yeah. Hello everyone. So I'm uh, I'm Serena. Yeah, I'm Serena. I'm head of design and sales and partner of Mogu. Uh, at Mogu, we are actually a startup company now, a small medium enterprise based in Italy, dedicated to the uh, to the let's say industrial development of mycelium-based materials. Mycelium is actually the root system, the vegetative stage of mushrooms. And we employ this living organism in order to create bio-based materials for interior design and architecture and many other potential applications. So I, I will actually like to start with the video of our company. Our relationship with the ecosystem is entirely compromised as irresponsible human activities keep causing great threats to life on Earth. Nature teaches us that it is possible to make efficient use of resources and take care of the full life cycle of things. Not only should we learn from nature, at Mogu we partner with nature to make things better. We employ mycelium, the root structure of mushrooms, to grow products and materials that are functional, sustainable and beautiful. Mycelium consists of a complex network of thread-like cells, which in nature grows by digesting dead plants and organic matters, forming a compact and densely interwoven structure. At Mogu, we employ mycelium to recycle residues from other industries to be transformed into beautiful products. We engineer our processes and provide the right conditions for mycelium to grow. While digesting the nutrients, over a few days the mycelium binds the loose fibers together and creates a coherent, solid and high-value composite material. When the product is fully formed, we stop the growth process, making the material stable and usable for multiple applications. Thanks to such unique technology, Mogu designs and manufactures products with novel aesthetics and remarkable performances such as acoustic wall panels and resilient flooring tiles. Our products are certified in line with stringent EU standards, proving their value and overall functioning without compromising their natural qualities. Mogu brings nature closer to people in everyday life contributing to a responsible revolution in regard to the origin and manufacturing of reliable items. 
At Mogu, we partner with nature to make things better. Thanks. So basically it all started from the design research of one, one of our founders, who has been Maurizio Montalti, who has been actually the pioneer in Europe for mycelium technology. Now, I don't know how much you know about fungi, but fungi are actually a, an amazing kingdom of organism that can do a lot of things. There is a whole new search about uh, exploring the potential of this living organism for multiple applications, such as materials development, but also actually uh, medicine, food of the future, and many, and generally bioremediation, for example. So uh, among all these, as Mogu, we decided to, let's say, focus on uh, one specific aspect. And the fascinating aspect of our work is that we indeed partner with nature in the sense that we collaborate with a living organism. So every day we interact with another living being that sometimes likes also to do what actually he prefers to do. <laughs> Not so much though, because we have learned how to actually guide the the growth of mycelium in order to replicate and standardize the outcome, the, the outcome of these natural processes of growth. So in a nutshell, we again, we employ mycelium, which is the living organism of fungi, and we activate the growth of mycelium onto a, a substrate of waste fibers. So for example, low value residues such as hem shives and cotton waste. Uh, mycelium grows by feeding onto these waste fibers, grows into them and binds them, creating a composite material that actually has different, several uh, interesting properties for interior design and architecture, but also other applications. Um, the, this collaboration with a living organism actually inspired us and was inspired as well from uh, the vision and the possibility to actually offer a new vision of interior design and architecture. So a radical stand towards a sustainable design and towards the, transi tra the transition towards the sustainability. And uh, that's how actually the payoff, which I really am fond of, radical by nature came about. Radical is also pun for being uh, uh, close to roots and in a sense mycelium could be seen uh, as a root system. So in a way we want to propose to embrace a more natural, if you want also imperfect uh, vision of architecture and design up to a certain standard of course because we still need to comply to European certification and you know all the needs and comfort of everyday comfort. So from a very, uh, the very start at Mogu, we started researching, of course, it's uh, heavily based on uh, R&D and technology, and we started, and biotechnology, of course, we explored 120 fungal species, more or less, and more than 30 combination of substrates, so uh, potential waste fibers that we could use to create materials. So over the years, in the first three years of R&D, we actually learned how to control the technology and not to create one material, for example, thermal insulation materials, but actually a range and a set of possibilities within the technology. And that is, for me, still the most fascinating aspect of our work. So for example, um, a, lo a lot of architects and designers approach us with other ideas that are not currently in our portfolio, and still we are able to support them in the definition of their ideas. But still, we decided quite early in our journey that we wanted to actually bring mycelium technology to an industrial um, development, to an industrial scale. So to achieve this, we thought it, it, should, it, it would be necessary to actually realize standardized uh, and fully certified products. And that's how we defined, uh, let's say, our portfolio of products as three collection of products. So in the end, three interpretations of mycelium technology and three potential application of mycelium technology. They are only just the start, let's say, of the uh, amazing possibilities of these materials. So generally we have developed a collection of acoustic panels, uh, a collection of wall panels that have sound absorbing and thermal insulation properties, and a collection of flooring products. So just to mention, and then maybe I can, uh, I'm not sure if, how long I can go on. <laughs> um, 
there is so much to tell, of course, I could go on, go on forever, basically. Uh, but the fascinating thing, the acoustic panels actually were the first born and they, are, they were quite the, let's say, first uh, collection of our products launched on the market in 2019. And they, they are actually the basic application of mycelium technology. In this case, mycelium grows into a mold and by growing takes exactly the shape of the mold. So there is no other post-forming process. At the end of the growing stage, which we know how to control, we then stop and completely, completely stop and deactivate the, the, the fungal growth and make the material completely inert and stable. A huge part of our work was also actually to uh, work together with some prestigious collaborators such as Harrop, of course, to further develop the technology, fine-tune the material properties, but also to, in generally, to uh, certify and standardize our products according to stringent European standards. That is something we really care about at Mogu. Uh, first of all, I would say because we are funded by an engineer, so <laughs> engineers like certifications. And secondly, no, jokes aside, because I need to introduce a novel technology to the market and a novel product to the market, especially when you are involving a living organism, you need to kind of reassure clients and customers about the reliability of these products. So having certified the whole product according to VOC emissions, fire certification, or and many other aspects, that, is, that was, I think, essential for our business development and market development. So instead, the Pluma panels are actually the, uh, the latest development of our research and technology. So they are kind of, in this case, mycelium is actually grown into large, larger plates, and it is then compressed at a medium density and embossed with a texture that can be also easily customized. In this case, our main goal was actually to create a much more industrial version of our products. So, Sometimes I get asked the question why mycelium offers a lot of, you know, unique possibilities in terms of aesthetics. Uh, if you see the vivarium exhibition, for example, uh, you will see a very peculiar uh, aesthetics in mycelium. We decided to kind of develop both, but also develop a in more industrial and perfected version of mycelium in a way because we strongly believe that still there is a quite peculiar aesthetics to mycelium. And still, we need to first introduce the products in a way that can be understood and appreciated at the level of comfort that can be introduced in society quite slowly. And then we will be able to offer the radical stand of uh, mycelium aesthetics. Last but not least, two words about the flooring. Uh, the flooring collection all started from actually the, my, the possibility of compressing mycelium fiberboards at very high density. So the fireboards that you see inside the tiles is actually the 100% waste-based and mycelium-based material. And it's still 100% biodegradable, as of course also the acoustic and pluma panels. Uh, then, of course, having a flooring product uh, that is biodegradable is not necessarily the best <laughs> combination of uh, adjectives. So. Uh, we needed to cover the floor with a coating in order to protect it, make it usable and washable. So we developed uh, our own coating, actually. Uh, we applied the principle of circular economy to uh, the coating development. And uh, that's how we started actually from waste materials, which we know very well, apparently, Amogu, <laughs> and we like. And we uh, recycled, in this case, a mix of oyster shells to create a durable uh, bio-based polyurethane system. So in a way also at Mogu, uh, that's another case in which we applied our vision of circular economy to a product that doesn't have mycelium in the end. And it's now a big really part of our portfolio and our market request. I would, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Serena. And yeah, me too. I'm communication manager from the Greta project, and we have a short intro video now. Today, the textile industry is one of the most polluting industries globally. Besides generating air pollution throughout the whole value chain, 
the textile industry is known to be a water-intensive sector, producing a high amount of polluted wastewater. It is estimated that from 2015 to 2030, water consumption and CO2 emissions will increase by at least 50% under a business-as-usual scenario. The volume and composition of the wastewater depend mainly on the used raw material and the textile production process. In 2019, well over 100 million tonnes of textile fibres were produced globally. The demand for textile fibres is estimated to nearly double by 2030 due to population growth. A way to minimise the environmental footprint of the current textile production is to reconsider the raw materials used in the first place. So, which are the textile fibres that are currently used? The main materials are fossil-based synthetic fibres, followed by cotton and so-called man-made cellulosic fibres, which include wood-based fibres. Synthetic fibres are based on fossil resources whose extraction and processing cause largely documented negative environmental impacts. Another much discussed drawback of textiles made of synthetic fibres is the fact that they break down into micro and nanoplastics. Although cotton is a renewable resource, its cultivation requires irrigation water, arable land, fertilisers and pesticides that increase its negative environmental impact. In addition, population growth will reclaim more land and water resources which will severely limit the increase of cotton production. The demand for alternative sustainable textile fibres is evident. But which will be the fittest solution? Cellulose is the most abundant polymer in the world and the main component of wood. Thus, as a renewable material, wood and wood-based fibres could become relevant in helping to solve the challenges related to the textile industry. But why are man-made cellulose fibres not already largely used in the textile industry? Currently, there are some bottlenecks that hinder their wider use. First, the raw material base to produce man-made cellulose fibres is limited nowadays. Secondly, the solvent systems currently available for man-made cellulose fibre production are often based on toxic or explosive chemicals. Thirdly, the textile production value chain is based on water-intense wet processes, even when using wood-based fibres. Is there a way to unlock the current bottlenecks and enable a sustainable production of man-made cellulose fibres in Europe? Yes, and Grete is aiming for that. Want to be updated about Grete's progresses and opportunities? Then get in touch. Follow us on our social media channels and subscribe to the Grete newsletter now. There is a lot to discover about man-made cellulose fibres produced from paper-grade craft pulp. Okay, so basically uh, today I will going to introduce you the Grete project. The Grete project um, Grete stands for Green Chemicals and Technologies for the Wood to Textile Value Chain. As you have seen in the video before, the textile industry currently has several issues related to sustainability mainly, but um, yeah, it's, it's quite an uh, important industry and polluting and having some strong um, environmental impact. So the Greta project uh, is tackling these problems, um, basically um, trying to find new solutions, new processes for the cellulose uh, fibers production. A quick introduction what are man-made cellulose fibers, as we have already uh, heard also in the video. So, um, as you can see, uh, textile fibers are basically um, dividable in two categories. There are the natural fibers, which are um, mechanically transformed to be used for the textile industry, and then there are the artificial fibers that are transformed or created by man, so man-made, uh, with uh, synthetic processes or chemical processes. Um, as you see, also natural fibers are basically two categories, so either based on cellulose or on proteins. The most uh, easy understandable for the cellulose would be cotton fibers. Uh, Protein-based fibers are wool or silk. Uh, Regarding the artificial fibers, there also we have uh, like 
say, um, different kind of polymers that are used as base materials. And here also you have the cellulose-based um, materials, which are called the man-made cellulosic fibers, or the acronym uh, MMCF. So what is the wood to textile value chain? So actually, it's not that we are talking about something new here. Um, wood as a resource for cellulose is already ex well, quite largely exploited. Um, as you can see, um, research and, and uh, um, activities to exploit wood as uh, to regenerate fibers from cellulose uh, already started in uh, over um, 100, a century ago. Um, so currently we have several man-made cellulosic fibers on the market. Um, so the, the value chain itself is nothing new. But there are some issues related to this value chain. And the Greater Project is tackling the issues in different um, aspects. First of all, um, it's trying to address, to offer a new uh, raw material for this value chain. And secondly, as we said before, um, the important part, important part in the transformation processes are the, the chemicals used. And, and then finally, um, the research project elaborate a new fiber, um, cellulosic fibers, but with different, um, with new um, properties and uh, mechanical uh, um, yeah, properties. So going a bit into details, why a new raw material? So the current uh, commercially available cellulose fibers start from um, a dissolving grade paper pulp, uh, wood pulp, sorry. So the dissolving grade pulp actually is very pure cellulose. And uh, that to gain this very pure cellulose component, um, um, a lot of transformation processes and also chemicals are needed. Um, in the greater project, uh, researchers were able to uh, define some enzymatic and uh, chemical transformations for paper grade wood pulp, this means that paper grade is, is the same pulp used to create paper to, so, um, that are used by biorefineries to create paper that you then use for other transformations into sheets or um, cardboards, um, so belonging, uh, coming from the craft process. Um, the other important aspect that uh, in this project, um, the chemical components um, have been uh, revised, let's say. So um, the technology is based on uh, super base ionic liquids, which are basically um, salt and malt, so mo uh, salt molten at ra uh, room temperature. And um, this dissolving system um, allows to be uh, recyclable and uh, much less harmful to the environment than the currently used chemical components because the ones used nowadays, um, some of them are uh, recyclable, but the chemical itself are toxic or also explosive, so a bit hard to handle and to manage. Um, but in this case, uh, the, the ionic liquids don't have these issues. And then, um, so basically, you take the paper grade pulp, uh, you can dissolve it with the ionic liquids and regenerate into man made cellulosic fibers. And these fibers have um, additional uh, functionalities. Um, they have a very good fire retardancy, um, so they don't burn, or let's say, don't burn as easy as uh, traditional cellulosic fibers. And also they have um, uh, chemical um, properties that allow uh, for a very good dye uptake. As you might know, um, the um, very important part of the um, textile industry is the use of fresh water in the finishing processes of the textile fibers. Um, so this um, aspect of the fiber allows to use much less water, fresh water for the dyeing process. And uh, so basically, whereas you were presenting, uh, a, uh, let's say, an in industrial um, example from the in industry, um, the Greta project is um, a collaboration of uh, private partners um, and research industry, um, private partners from the industry and the research institutions. Uh, they work together jointly with funds from the European Union's Horizon 2020 project and also the Bio-Based Industries Consortium. So um, 
two large European uh, institutions uh, that uh, invested in this four-year research project that's actually finishing right now. And um, but uh, it was a very interesting and uh, prolific collaboration, and the fibers actually are shown in the exhibition, in the Vivarium exhibition right outside. So if afterwards you want to come there and have a look at the fibers, you're very welcome. And yeah, that's it from my side. And now I think that we pass to the dying aspects, right? No. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Kaori Akiyama of Studio Baikara. Uh, I'm based on the uh, Tokyo in Japan. Uh, I so introduced uh, my studio. My studio's name is uh, Studio Baikara. Uh, studio Baikara is uh, dedicated to find meaning and the effect that uh, uh, color and materials uh, harp on people. And this firm is known to the uh, employ wide range of colors and material in product design and space design, as well as uh, branding. Uh, this is an uh, experimental creation. Um, this uh, name is uh, Inherent Patam. Uh, this project is a um, personal project I've been working on for about 10 years, uh, ever since my 2013 exhibit, exhibition, Experimental Creations, that focused on experiment in material and the creation process. I process uh, various board leaves using chemicals for a certain period of time to expose the beauty of the characteristic patterns possessed by each tree and uh, utilize them in products such as contemporary jewelry, architecture fittings, and uh, time pieces. And uh, I collaborated with the Japanese Urushi craftsman in Kyoto. This product won IF Design Award in Germany uh, last year. I made this um, B. Uh, please show them.
Thank you so much. And, uh, I introduce the next one. Uh, this project is uh, Mashiro. Uh, Mashiro is uh, another project. I collaborated with the uh, wood manufacturer in Hiroshima Prefecture in Japan. The they are on a mission to circulate Hinoki. Hinoki is a cypress forest uh, of Hiroshima. The tree have not been used since they are planted after the war. I'm sorry, only Japanese. Uh, many species of trees grow in the area, but Hinoki is the most common human controlled timber species. I designed the chair in cypress material, uh, which is soft and unsuitable for furniture. The legs are designed to be as thick as possible to ensure strength. On the other hand, uh, the legs had to be oriented so that they didn't look heavy. Uh, it says that uh, Japanese people st uh, started using chair about 70 years ago. Uh, that's not that long. Until then, uh, they lived their lips sitting freely on the floor. I want to make a chair for such Japanese to sit freely using a large amount of Japanese cypress hinoki. This is, uh, sorry, this is for public and for work. In order to use a lot of cypress, design ideas were extended, expanded to allow it to be used in a variety of locations. The third project, uh, this name is Konoha. Konoha is another project. Uh, I collaborated with the Japanese material manufacturers. They have developed a new polycarbonate material uh, precarbonate resin that can contain colored materials in its materials. The precarbonate is a strong resin, as you know, that used for suitcase and the cell phone uh, exteriors. But until now, uh, it has had to be painted to enhance its authentic appeal. Uh, since the new polycarbonate doesn't require painting and uh, it's suitable for long-term use and recycling, the sample designs were needed to convey the appeal of product developers at various manufacturers. Uh, I felt uh, the need to create even one uh, beautiful form without arranging them in an uh, orderly fashion. So I utilize natural motif motifs. The leaf shapes are suitable for various exhibitions, and I have been able to have to exhibit them effectively in Japan, Hong Kong, Milan, and many other places. The, we had an exhibition at Losana Orandi in, in Milano Design Week last year. 
The gallery has very good light uh, coming through the window. Now we, it's not my ear, the, I also designed uh, the ear cuff with the same material, uh, safe to use for people with uh, metal allergies. And the uh, color samples, uh, they are uh, material samples that can express hue, lightness, and uh, saturations, as well as transparency as grow, uh, and growth. The sp spaces, uh, spaces was created as simple as possible so that the quality of the material could be conveyed. The trunks, right side trunks uh, from which the sample were hung were made of mesh and uh, became very small pieces of rubbish after the exhibition. Uh, I believe that word the final um, this project is uh, uh, exhibited in there Vivarium. Um, Do you know uh, how Japanese seaweed nori, known as onigiri or sushi, is made? Uh, it made by knitting and forming in the sea. The seaweed, uh, which has been well notorious by the sea, is then formed into square like this, and then dried to form seeds of dried nori. Do you know uh, how the black color of nori is produced? <laughs> For example, uh, the paintings, red, blue, yellow uh, pigments are all mixed together to produce black. Similarly, it's uh, known that the better the nori is uh, blacker it and uh, the higher the grade and expensive, mm -hmm. as it contain many ingredients such as red, green, and blue. Uh, there are fecal, fecal everything, uh, chlorophyll, fecal, uh, I'm sorry, fecal cinnamon, and uh, carotenoid. Uh, it might be possible to decompose the colors by med mediating something, I hypothesize uh, it. Um, various experiments were uh, conducted. To our surprise, uh, we found that uh, seaweed can extract a beautiful red color like this. Uh, simply by soaking in the water. The green one can be extracted with oil or alcohol. Research uh, revealed that the red algae, algae, algae uh, elements, which absorb uh, nutrients, uh, play an important role in knowledge ability to uh, photosynthesize and uh, survive in the sea. 
and uh, uh, Nuri Pigment project uh, decided to delve, delve into the fascina fascination of the red color uh, behind the seaweed. The uh, all pigments are extracted from nori. The each of these can be used to control the pigment uh, to an acidic or alkaline state by adding vinegar or soda water. The center is a red uh, color extracted directly from nori. On the left is uh, acidic, and uh, on the right, uh, alkaline. Experiment were control, uh, conducted on drying a variety of seed shaped objects such as uh, wool with animal protein, silk, cotton, and polyester, quilt, and the Japanese paper, as well as nori. These are samples drying with this nori pigment. I'm very happy that the first place to exhibit this work is at the here Brera Museum during Milan Design Week. And uh, I really like uh, the title, the Vivarium. Color is a very delicate and uh, fleeting thing. Uh, however, uh, we have succeeded in visualizing the crimson color that makes Nori exist as Nori. Um, today, uh, a wide range of synthetic materials and uh, color light flow into the sea. And this Nori pigment is an experimental in initiative to consider the positive, uh, possibility of incorporating pigments originally found in the sea into our daily lives. I want to ask you to describe uh, uh, the direction uh, the bio-based materials are going on and uh, your preferable uh, future let's say uh, 10 years uh, from now we can start uh, with okay, thanks uh well of course there is um we started eight years ago and uh i would say that back then uh, almost no one knew the concept of circular economy <laughs> or at least there was this uh these two words uh overing around the world but no one really knew. Nowadays, it's like saying, hello, how are you, basically? Uh, and everyone is talking about it. Different thing, it's, so it really changed in the last two years after COVID, I think. Uh, really switched to companies understanding that they need to take a stand uh, towards the sustainability, mainly. And this is, of course, uh, in favor of bio-based materials. So in the next years, we will see how uh, biomass materials will effectively uh, be implemented in projects, in real projects in architecture and interior design, but also fashion, product development. Uh, I think a big, a big factor of the next step for the biobased materials will be to face the issue of aesthetics, which we at Mogu personally care, I personally care a lot about, <laughs> because being uh, trained as an industrial designer, I, I strongly believe that dismissing comfort, aesthetic comfort as, you know, uh, as an aspect that, yeah, it's sustainable, so you ch should choose it because it's sustainable, no? Uh, but if it doesn't have a peculiar aesthetic or uh, a, like a refined aesthetics, actually, 
um, it will be missing out some potential in the future. So for example, when plastic back then, you know very well the story uh, was introduced, it was associated to cheap project products. Actually, before it was backlight, then it was real plastic from Giulianatta. It was associated to cheap products, you know, and it took so many years and maybe didn't even happen actually to plastic to gain back value, actually. And although it's unfortunately very polluting, plastic was an amazing material that actually permitted a lot of things and a lot of the industrial development and the social development that we have today. So um, I think in a way also another step uh, beside aesthetics for bio-based materials, so going a little bit beyond, you know, the fiberness of recycled materials. There is a lot of hemp boards that look all the same, actually. Uh, and I speak also for mycelium materials. It's not that we have the solution, but of course mycelium does offer a different uh, aesthetics compared to other recycling technology because it covers the material, it has this white, uh, aspects that almost look a little bit like plastic, uh, synthetic, but it's actually organic and people do understand it. And then there is the smell factor, which is in mycelium, in our case, we found the compromise thanks to the coating. So generally the experience of, my, of materials, not only mycelium, of bio-based materials will be needed to be tackled much more in products integration to be integrated really in projects and products in general uh, there will be a lot of work to rethink the world as we know it with sustainable materials and the part of this will be also the cultural aspect so people tend to understand uh, bio-based materials as an alternative solution that is just more sustainable but it performs exactly the same cost efficiency technical performance the same durability the same it's not like this. It should be like a, a, a shift of paradigm in which a change really of mindset in which you understand that sometimes it's really necessary to have a very durable product. Then there's plastic. That's a beautiful, durable, uh, century long product. Or uh, it should be sterile. And then again, maybe plastic is the answer and maybe it will be a bio-based plastic in the future that is able to, sus to sustain sterilization, which is a very strong process. And when it, it is instead not the case, for example, interior designs often get renovated like every three years or every year and a half even, and they still ask about long lasting durability because if we want to live in a perfected world, but the reality is that if you look into forest and nature, there's nothing as perfection and durability. It, there is actually impermanence, which uh, give us comfort when we are in the forest and in nature, actually, when we experience nature. So the cultural shift will be needed to think about materials differently and not trying to find, you know, just a replacement for uh, a more sustainable replacement for materials that we used to uh, to use in our products. So try to start really from the materials, material driven process and redesign the world as we know it. So that's another part for me. <laughs> yeah, I perfectly agree with you. And uh, especially I want to highlight that maybe it's it's not as you said, we don't just need to substitute materials if we are used to use, but rethink what kind of resources we are using to produce the materials, what are the processes we, we apply to transform these materials and also then uh, create products or uh, other ways of using the materials. So it's more thinking of the whole system and that's also what the circular economy is about. So not thinking about what's happening at the end of the life of a material or a product, but how it integrates in the whole system. And as we have also seen uh, with all these examples and also the, the Grete project, maybe it's not, uh, I mean, the raw material is important, but the transformation process and the chemical components and everything that is linked to transforming the materials, this is the very um, important part probably. So, and as you said, yeah, I think in the last years, a lot happened, a lot of, change, uh, uh, a lot of acceler acceleration is happening. Um, this is both um, 
forced a bit by policy. So, for instance, European Commission trying to um, help or force the industry to, to look for new uh, solutions, for more sustainable solutions. And, but also, um, as you said, also the cultural change is happening. So customers demanding for different kind of um, materials that are considered more sustainable. And there, I think the fashion industry is really an important um, voice or uh, yeah, um, how can we say uh, a platform to help to make this shift and uh, i think as fashion is always at the avant-garde also here it should and it does um, have an important role um when i design the product uh, i think uh, it's important uh, why is the material uh, why is the color uh, I consider that um, the purpose uh, for the um, other material. Uh, now uh, we design um, the furniture and the daily product. Uh, and we use the wood and the metal and the plastic. Uh, but uh, we should consider that uh, how long it's uh, how long uh, do we use uh, the product now for example the uh, if it's a short time um, short time uh, we we use the uh, we design the, uh, um, the for example biomaterial uh, it's not strong uh, to uh, um i'm sorry uh, um, it's different and difficult to uh, burn and uh, but more uh, if uh, we uh, want to use the long time for example the furniture in the product uh then we should uh, uh, we should select it the more strong material the uh, maybe um, you who developed the new material or uh, I, I want to uh, know uh, how strong uh, each material uh, we can use the long time mm. um. <laughs> No, they were terrible. Honestly, <laughs> the first materials from Mogu were really like terrible. <laughs> it took three years, uh, very honestly, like I say, it took us three years of product and material development before we could get. Of course, there was, I'm saying this as a joke, there was a potential. I, when Mogu started, uh, there was a kind of an artistic experimentation from Maurizio, which was Maurizio Montalti. Uh, which was already like the basics, but then when you scale up and you, when you are working with a living organism, you know, uh, we saw that when you do one thing, maybe one break on one plate of material, you do it once, looks perfect. You do it three times, looks still perfect. You do it 10 times, nothing works anymore. Like, you don't know why <laughs> exactly. Or even it happened to us that, uh, you know, we have different shapes. And actually, that's a funny story I really like. Um, we started with the hexagon, then we switch on the square. Every time we switch to a new, uh, to a new, uh, the material was exactly the same, same fungal species, same protocol. It was working. Uh, a new shape. The first 10 times we were doing a shape, so 10 panels, somehow it wasn't growing correctly. It needed to learn a shape. And then I was telling this to a mycologist, and I was telling, see, he needs to learn the shape, and he said, it doesn't make any sense, Serena. It doesn't make any sense from any biological point of view. Then later on, we had an European research project, because at Mogu, a big part of our R&D is funded by European research projects, and we still do. We have 
six active projects right now at the moment, for example. Um, so one project was called Fungar on living architecture uh, with Andy Andamansky, who was, by the way, the, the guy who studied the intelligence of plants with Stefano Mancuso. So not necessarily, not really like a small <laughs> researcher. And he, he then switched to studying the intelligence of fungi because he just got crazy about fungi. And, uh, and he started, was studying the response of fungi, of our fungal strains, to stimulus. So for example, he studied uh, the, the response, the, the neurological, neural response of fungi when he was put in triangle, square, or circle. And he finally proved what I was telling, that uh, fungi can tell the shape of, uh, of the mold. So it took us really long time to um, to, of course, develop strong materials at, at a certain level, they are still not comparable, of course, to wood or uh, other plastic materials, of course, uh, because mycelium materials have their own strength, their own, uh, you know, positive aspects and their own very weak points. So the thing is to design the material without um, dismissing the natural ability of the living organism you work with. So, for example, in nature, mycelium is a binder because that's what it does in nature. It connects, it binds fibers together. Why would you use it to, as a tensile material, you know, as a structural material, which is not its normal property? So you need to design according to the organism, in our case of bio-based growing materials, which is a really niche. <laughs> Uh, and um, understanding the material and learning from the material in order to make products out of it without forcing too much, I think. Yeah, I think in, in the greater project, the situation is completely the opposite because basically you, um, you were defining the product or based on the, the, the materials you had at hand, you could define the properties of the material. Whereas uh, when you're defining a new fiber uh, for an already existing industry, obviously the properties and the, um, uh, yeah, of the fiber, they need to be compliant with the market uh, requirements. So the fibers that are created in the greater project, they perfectly respond to the market requirements and um, have all the, let's say, standard um, properties as have uh, commercially available fibers. So there, the, the the, the fibers that you're going to produce has to respond to already set requirements. So durability and whatever is um, achieved. Or from the beginning, that's also the case for, for us. But now, not at the beginning of the project. Uh, well, mm, no, the, the, the aim was to, to have a fiber that is perfectly uh, economic or uh, commercially viable. So it, it had to respond to the, to the requirements. <laughs> Maybe I when it started, the research, so the yeah. very first experiments, I don't think it was like one shot, right? Uh, no, but... Um, sorry. No. <laughs> um, uh, how can I say? Well, uh, let's say that the, in this case, the, the processes and the technologies they are, that are used uh, are standard processes, like um, the regeneration process is based on already existing processes. Uh, so basically, um, only the chemical po components are new or let's say a bit different than the, the traditional ones. And but uh, for instance, the, 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 um, the spinning process of the fibers is based on a dry jet wet spinning process. So that the parameters are given by the, by the technology. So let's say the, the components to crea create the fiber um, need to be set before in order then obtain the fiber that actually uh, has then all the parameters uh, needed for, uh, for the commercial application. Materials are growing materials also, so it's a uh, little different. And Actually, I think an interesting part was that, yeah, if I think about it, in a way, your, the material, the fiber is engineered beforehand. Uh, we can't be better engineers than nature, of course. So uh, nature engineers his own 
actually our mycelium engineers is on composite material, we can only try to kind of guide or work with the organism. So we are still learning quite a lot. Um, how to sometimes cope with some limitations, how to sometimes improve, overcome limitations. Um, and uh, it's still really fascinating to see how a fungus can, uh, you know, sometimes I, I stop and still marvel at the, the things that a fungus can do, honestly. Mm. So I don't know how, which example, but I think the example of the shape is still the best thing you know and uh, for example we recently did a custom fee piece for a project at the biennale of venice mm. which will be at arsenale for giardini i can remember and it's a huge uh, hood and the and the base and in that case the mycelium actually eventually liked the shape <laughs> so <laughs> he went straight up and he actually no the thing is because it was shaped by hand as well, actually. It was sculpted by hand. And there is a whole body of research, again, on the, how mycelium, when, it, when the, actually the grower interacts with the material with the hands and care, of course, the material and mycelium especially responds really well to this care. And uh, that's what happened. Yeah. <laughs>